morning, everybody. You feeling good this morning? All right. I'll take that. I'll take that. I'll take that. I just want to remind you of a few quick things. We're going to dismiss our fifth and sixth grade really quickly. If you're in fifth or sixth grade, let's clap for them as we welcome everyone joining us online. Come on. You can do better for them. There you go. We're glad to have everyone joining us online as well. I want to remind you, Women's Retreat is coming up September 30 through October 2. It's called Remain. It's going to be awesome. Ladies, you do not want to miss that. Go to declaration.org. Uh, you heard... Uh, Pastor Sterling talked about 21 days. It is not too late. We engage week two beginning tomorrow. And so you can go to declaration.org as well and sign up for those daily emails. They come in at about 6 a.m. every morning. And last but not least, I just want to further emphasize that small group. We don't want it from you. We want it for you. I promise your life can be changed sitting in those circles week after week, just meeting with people, um, being in the presence of the Lord, probably having some good food. And so uh, we want you to be a part of that. So make sure next week you engage declaration.org and start looking for that group that you want to jump into. We want to see you grow in Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, let's jump into week two of our series called Speak the Name. Last week, we asked this question, what's in a name? And I didn't get to finish last week, so I'm going to try to finish last week's message this week, all right? But what's in a name? That's the question. Now, my pastor um, that I sat under when I received the greatest gift from Jesus of salvation, his name was Dr. Larry Peaton. And he used to tell this story, and so I figured, you know, what a better week. I, I need to share this story that, that Dr. Larry used to say. This is the story he would share. A thief broke into a beautiful suburban house once and was looking around for things to steal when he heard a voice out of nowhere say, better be careful, Jesus is watching you. He stopped for a minute, kind of stunned, looked around, didn't see anything, and, uh, you know, kind of froze in his tracks. <laughs> um, Looked around with a flashlight, still didn't see anything, but he did see something in the corner. There was a parrot staring at him from inside of a cage. And so he, he started thinking, surely not. And so he walked over to the cage, looked at the parrot. And he says, did you just say something to me? And uh, right then, of course, the parrot looked at him and said, yes, Jesus is watching you. What's your name, the thief says. My name is Moses, says the parrot, and I'm warning you, Jesus is watching you. And the man laughs and says, well, I don't believe in Jesus, and besides that, you have a dumb name for a bird. I mean, what kind of idiot would name their pet bird Moses? The parrot replies, the same kind of idiot that would name a 150-pound Rottweiler dog Jesus. <laughs> What's in a name, <laughs> Right? See, last week we determined that names are important. Names speak to identity. Now, with that in mind, I just want to emphasize a few things that we hit on last week. We spent a lot of time looking, obviously, the name above all names, the name that we've been singing all morning. We are unapologetic about this name, Jesus. It's the only name that rescues and saves. It's the only name that assures security. It's the only name that we find a, a peace for our anxiety, it's the only name that has all authority, the only name that can provide healing for our hurts and for our sicknesses. It's the only name by which we are fully, truly satisfied, and it's the only name by which we are saved. These are some of the things that we talked about last week. This name is truly the name that is above every name, Jesus. The Bible says that this name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess this name, Jesus. At some point or another, it's in him and his name that we find our meaning, our reason, and our purpose. That's just kind of a very brief summary of a whole lot of things that we said last week. If you missed last week, please go back and catch that, okay? And I pray so deeply that you were encouraged last week to understand and believe and, and really um, ask the Lord to, to let faith rise up, to put your faith or trust in that you can know you can call upon the name, the, the name that has uncontainable power, limitless power. You can call upon the name of Jesus no matter what it is that you're dealing with right now. At any point, you can call upon the name Jesus. In fact, I had a vision as we were in worship this morning, and I kept asking the Lord, is this a today vision? I don't think it is, but I believe that there's a time where, where we might need to just practice that. We may need to practice praying in that way for one another. Just, you know what, I, I'm feeling led to pray for you. I'm going to come and I'm going to pray out loud in the name of Jesus 
declaring truth over your life where the enemy is trying to convince you of lies. Declaring the name of Jesus over you where maybe the enemy has you in some sort of oppressive bondage, but we know that Jesus came to set you free. And so we're going to declare and proclaim the name of Jesus. You can call upon the name of Jesus. He's your healer. He's your hope. He's your deliverance. He holds your destiny. And at the mention of his name, all of hell trembles and everything can change. Okay, so I just want to establish the baseline. We're going to go to Acts chapter 3. If you've got your Bible, would you go to Acts chapter 3 with me? If you do not have a Bible, I'm seeing right here in these response tables to your left and to your right, in the front and in the back, there's some free Bibles in there. I know at the information center there's some Bibles. We would love to give you a physical copy of the Bible if you do not have it. It is the most important book. It is a living word. It's active. The Holy Spirit will empower it and change your life. We want you to have a copy of that. So if you don't have that, please grab it. Feel free, it's yours. We're going to be in Acts chapter 3. There's a story of a man who'd been born unable to walk. He had a deformity. He had a handicap. This had been his existence from birth now well into adulthood. So this is kind of the landscape by which we're going to launch into this narrative. Every day this gentleman would be carried. I'm not sure who carried him, but whoever did would carry him to this certain gate that was outside of the temple And the gate was named Beautiful. And he would be carried there so that he could beg everyone who was about to enter into the temple grounds, whether to go to worship or to prayer. I assume I'm hoping to kind of play off the potential heart of charity as people are coming to pray and worship. This is where he chose to post himself every day and beg. He would beg for food. He would beg for money. He would beg for any sort of charitable gift that could be possible that maybe someone would offer to him just for his sustenance, just for his mere survival, if you will. And this is how he lived day in and day out. It was his daily liturgy. It was not just his habit, not just his routine. It was his necessary thing that he would have to do every day. And this is where we launch into Acts chapter 3. And as we do, we see two disciples of Jesus, Peter and John, heading into the temple around 3 p.m., the hour to pray. And that's where they're heading, and they're going to actually approach this gate. So look at verse 3 with me in Acts chapter 3. It says, when this man, this man with handicap, saw Peter and John about to go into the temple grounds, he began asking to receive a charitable gift. So here comes Peter and John, disciples of Jesus. They they enter, there's the gate, beautiful, there's the man. He, he begins to ask for gifts, and I just want to stop right here and just kind of repeat an illustration that I've used often before. It's very applicable. It's very extremely relevant, timely. It's a nursery rhyme that we all know. You've heard me say it before, but it's powerful. It's got a punchline to it, and it just might apply to some of us. So if you know this, finish it with me. Humpty Dumpty sat on a what? Humpty Dumpty had a great what? All the kings what? And what? And what could they not do? So we all know our nursery rhymes. And the question is, i got to ask the question, how many times have we looked to people, places, or things to try to put us back together? Every single one of us at some point, I know me, I know me, I know my history. I know how many times, rather than just looking to the king, I've chosen to look to people, places, or things. Maybe let me ask it this way. How many times have we looked to or depended upon things or others or stuff even to try and find some sense of peace and joy and satisfaction and help or even healing? So that's where this man finds himself. We see it in verse 3. He's a, he's a man with an affliction. He sees Peter and John about to enter into the temple grounds. He begins asking, depending upon them, to receive this charitable gift. He's asking them for some sort, some semblance of help, if you will. But verse 4 says, Peter, along with John, looks at this man intently. I thought about that word, intently intentionally, if you will, they look at this man and they see this divine purpose in a moment. They see a a moment that they need to be moment ready. They are focusing in on this man. And they say, look at us. Look at us. Not look to us, look at us. Peter and John, they know something here that maybe this man doesn't know. That, That they had learned where to place their trust, where to place their hope. So they instruct this man, again, lift up your eyes, look at us. Chances are, listen, chances are this man would rarely ever make eye contact with anybody. 
most likely due to a great lack of dignity. You can't know all that this guy had gone through in his life. But for sure, one can assume he had a difficult life. He had a life full of disappointment. He had a life full of discouragement. I can only imagine. Probably a life full of degrading comments. Deep hurt. It's been his whole life. It's all he's ever known. He's not like all the other kids. He's not like all. He can't do what everyone else can do. So here he is sitting at this gate called beautiful. Begging. Even for a piece of bread. Something. Look at us, they say. Look at us. I mean, this guy didn't have all the opportunities that everybody else may have had. He didn't have the abilities everyone else might have had. He, he had a deformity that many people different didn't have. He, he was different. And here he is begging at this beautiful gate where people are trying to enter in to go worship and pray, hopeful for even just a small, just give me some charity um, from people who should honestly be postured to do it, right? There's Peter and John. As if that this is an appointment for a divine discussion. Look at us, they say. Not to us, look at us. Give us your attention. And look at verse 5. The man gives them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter says, I do not have silver and gold. I don't have silver and gold. What you're looking for, what you're asking for, we don't have. We don't have what it is that you're seeking in this moment. We can't give to support or satisfy, watch this, your symptoms, but we can speak to the source of your symptom. Oh, don't miss this stuff right here. See, I wonder how many times we focus on the symptom rather than the source. We hyper-focus on the symptom of the moment rather than the source. A man was praying with his pastor at the altar where he had found himself often, and he had really been struggling with this certain thing for a long, long time. Um, He prayed with this pastor so many times before over the same issue, and he would always pray the same thing. At the end, he would say, Lord, please just remove the cobwebs. Take the cobwebs out of my life. He found himself at that same altar over and over, praying about the same, the very same thing, almost like he was on this merry-go-round of repentance, if you will. And he would always finish the prayer the same way. Lord, please just remove the cobwebs out of my life. And so on this certain particular Sunday morning, he finds himself there at the altar again. He grabs the pastor, and he's He's confessing again. I'm still struggling. I still need, and, and, and he starts to pray. And Lord, please remove the cobweb. And as soon as he gets the cobwebs, the pastor interrupts and says, Lord, please just kill the spider. Kill the spider, right? How many of us are, are, are hyper focused on the symptom and not the source? How many times have we sought out manna for the moment while missing the miracle in the making? While in, listen, while in the name of Jesus, we can speak to the root, to the source, and we can offer something so much greater, restoration, reconciliation, redemption. But look, Peter says, I don't have silver and gold. I don't have it. But what I do have, Peter says, I give to you. What I do have, I give to you. And look what he says next. He says, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, he says, walk. Now, pause. Remember, This guy has suffered from this afflicted deformity since birth. This is all he's known. In fact, everyone around him, from family to friends to neighbors to whatever else, this is all they've ever known of this man. And now here comes Peter and John. I don't know how this man is. Old enough to be an an adult individual carried to this beautiful gate daily to hopefully try to play off the, the posture, the heart of charity, to look for charity, to beg for sustenance, to beg even for just a little bit of manna for the moment. And, and now here's Peter in the name, not just, no, in the name of Jesus, you walk. I don't have silver and gold, but what I do have, I'm about to give to you. Do you see the difference here? Can you feel the gravity of that? I don't know how many, uh, you know, I don't know if you've ever been in a a financial burden where you just kind of wish that, you know, you had the the, the genie power, the blink power, and all of a sudden it just goes away, right? I don't have silver and gold. I don't have bread to give you. I don't have water to give you. I don't have wine to offer. I don't have anything to offer you, but what I do have to offer, I freely give. Walk. Walk. 
I don't want to just change your moment. I want to change your life in the mighty name of Jesus. It's not about me. It's about him. Walk. This is what he says in verse 7. And grasping him by the right hand. Now watch this. <laughs> he puts feet to his faith, believing that this man's going to be healed. And he begins to help the man up. Grasping him by the right hand, he raises him up. The man's feet and ankles begin to be strengthened immediately, Scripture says. And look what happens. Verse 8. Leaping up. The man stood and begins to walk, and he enters the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Now, maybe you're here and you're like, that's really cool, Pastor John. We don't see that stuff happen. Why not? Maybe it's because we're too busy offering silver and gold or trying to. And we're not living into the power, the dunamis power found in the name, the only name that can save, the only name that can heal. The only name that we have read over and over that would make the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the lame to walk, the name of Jesus. It's just a question. It's just food for thought. I'm not accusing. I'm just asking. And I'm asking you just as I'm asking myself. Remember this man, he's just trying to satisfy his daily need. That's all he's looking for. Just asking for a little bit of money, not looking for a miracle, just seeking a little bit of manna, not hoping for mobility, right? And so I'm sure at some point he, he's lost he probably at some point long ago lost any hope for healing. Maybe it wasn't even a construct in his mind. He had moved on. Listen, he had probably grown accustomed to his situation. And even he had probably even settled into it. Now, don't miss this. How many of us have grown so accustomed to our situation? How many of us have just settled into our situation, forgetting that we have the very resurrected power of Jesus living inside of us? Or how many times do we just begin to panic and look at all the king's horses and all the king's men trying to find just a little bit of gold, trying to find just a little bit of bread, all the while forgetting the king who created us, who knows us better than we even know ourselves, who is able not to just provide for a moment, but can still perform a miracle. How many times? See, our struggle is how easily and often we settle for the manna of the day and end up foregoing the miracle because we don't either understand who Jesus really is. We don't maybe understand the power in the name of Jesus. Maybe we struggle with belief or unbelief, uh, a belief issue, so it's unbelief. Or maybe, maybe we don't understand who we are in Jesus and, and what it is that we possess in Jesus as a child of, of God. Maybe we don't understand our identity or even worse, maybe we do not understand who Jesus is at all, his power and 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 what he truly came to do in and through and for us. We don't evoke the name of Jesus, maybe from a lack of belief and faith. Think about this. Listen, here's this man every day doing the same thing, not even aware that the kingdom of heaven is about to fall upon his life. Maybe he didn't understand or believe in the beauty and power of the name of Jesus, which had the ability to and was about to transform everything about his life. So here's the first thing I want us to see today. Because of who Jesus is and the power that is in his name, when we speak the name of Jesus, the very mention of his name carries so much power. I said it a while ago that all of hell trembles. But here's the point. In the name of Jesus, we really can find help and we really can find healing. It can happen. It can happen. We can keep looking to all the king's horses and all the king's men and stay completely stuck in our situation on the merry-go-round of, Lord, please remove the cobwebs. Or we can begin to go to the source and say, Jesus, I don't, I don't even begin to understand the nuance of this, this situation that I'm in. But all I know is the power of your name, Jesus. The Petro that's behind that. And I'm going to call upon your name. And not only that, I'm not just going to get in my little prayer closet and huddle up by myself with my comfy little prayer blanket. No, no, I'm going to get bold in the streets. I'm going to scream it to nations and neighborhoods. Jesus, name, walk. In Jesus' name, walk. In Jesus' name, walk. Maybe you're dealing with the depression this morning. In Jesus' name, walk. Maybe you're dealing with your own affliction this morning. In Jesus' name, walk. 
walk. Maybe you're dealing with temptation this morning, and it's been tearing you apart. In Jesus' name, walk. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Resist anxiety. The devil will flee from you. Resist depression. In, in Jesus' name, I rebuke depression, and I invite peace. In Jesus' name, walk. Come on, somebody. Peter says, I don't have silver and gold, but what I do have, I give in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, walk. What would happen, listen to me, church, what would happen if more Jesus followers would step out in faith and start to speak the name of Jesus over the darkness over the storms, over the situation, over the sickness, over the disease, over the sin problem, over the spirit of suicide, what would happen if Jesus' followers began to evoke and declare and speak the name of Jesus over and into all these things? See, it's more than just thinking about it and talking about it and, and high-fiving it on Sunday. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. It's all-inclusive. Verse 7, grasping him by the right hand, he raises him up immediately. His feet and ankles are strengthened. Leaping, he stands, begins to walk. He enters the temple. He's walking. He's leaping. He's praising. What was different in this story than any other day? What was the X factor? What brought the change? It was simply Jesus in the name of Jesus. Meaning, by the authority and the truth of the person and power of Jesus in his name, we can find help and we can receive healing. People saw what was happening, verse 9. All the people saw him walking. They see this man that they've recognized. They know who he is. He's been by the gate every day where they've gone. And now they're seeing him walking. They're seeing him leaping. They're seeing him praise God, verse 10. And they recognize him. And being the very one who used to sit by the beautiful gate of the temple to beg for charitable gifts, they're filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to this man. See, people who want once saw this man as just a handicap, now sees a man walking healed. And, and there, he's praising God. So here's the second thing I want you to see this morning. Not only can we find help and healing in Jesus' name, but in the name of Jesus, we can have hope. And let me just be honest, man. Somebody may be sitting here going, this is really simple, but you know what? There's a, there's a large contingency of people here that are just hanging on by a thread. They need hope. We need hope. Watch the news for 10 hot seconds. We, this world needs hope. And that hope is not going to be found in all the king's horses and all the king's men. They can't put you back together again. That hope is only found in the person and in the name of Jesus. So not only did this miracle give this man hope, but also it began to spread. The hope began to spread to others. Let's keep going. 11. While he's clinging to Peter and John. All the people runs to them in the portico named Solomon's, completely astonished. But when Peter sees this, he replies to all these people. He says, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Why are you staring at us as though by our own power our, or our own godliness we, we made this man walk? It's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers. He has glorified his servant and son, Jesus, the one whom you handed over and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he decided to release him. But you disown the holy and the righteous one and ask for a murderer to be granted to you, but put to death the prince of life whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. So all of a sudden, Peter just gets bold and says, whoa, 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 tell me out. Why are you so freaked out about this? We tried to tell you. Hello? Hello? Why are you surprised? Why is this so amazing? Watch this. When this should be expected, church. Why would this be so amazing when it should be expected? We should be, why are you astonished at this miracle, basically? He's saying, he's, he, prior to you killing him, he tried to tell you who he was, but many of you wouldn't listen. You chose a criminal over a king. You chose a menace over a miracle worker. Here's the inconvenient and comfortable truth, uncomfortable truth this morning. Listen, too many times I have found, even in my, in my unbelief, in our unbelief, we don't speak the name of Jesus because we don't choose Jesus. Listen to me. We don't speak his name because we don't choose him. Rather than choosing to believe, we actually choose our own Barabbas. Rather than live in radical faith, we just choose to... Fake it until we maybe make it, thinking maybe somehow something's going to change. 
Or maybe we lean into remembering your spirit and we get our theology from Oprah. Or, or we go read Stephen Covey, Seven Habits, and we try to self-help ourselves. Did you hear what I just said? Run in the bookstore if you see self-help. I'm sorry. Run. All the king's horses and all the king's men cannot do it. I'm not saying don't better yourself. I'm just saying the best of yourself is going to be found in Jesus' name. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Before somebody sends me an email, hear my heart. <laughs> we, listen, we, a lot of us times, it's like we would rather stay on the hamster wheel of our hurt or the merry-go-round of our attempt at sin management. Lord, please just remove the cobwebs. We'd rather do that than truly surrender, die to self, and trust in the power and the provision found in the all-consuming, mighty, powerful name of Jesus. See, too often we grow too comfortable and we just simply settle for manna in the moment. And here's what Peter is saying. He's saying, what you're seeing today, everybody, is the power of God on display. It's the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of our fathers, your fathers. It's your God who has now glorified his servant and his son Jesus, the one you put to death when you chose a criminal over Christ, the one you chose not to believe. But God has raised Jesus from the dead through this miraculous means, and now it's in his name. Name, the mighty name of Jesus that this man has been raised to walk from miraculous means. And on the basis of faith, verse 16 says, in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. All glory to Jesus. This wasn't us. All glory to Jesus. I like the way the NIV reads. Look, by faith in the name of Jesus. Don't miss this. In the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name. Make no mistake. Two different times. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed this man, as you all can see. See, twice in this one single verse, there is a reference to the name of Jesus. I don't know if you're picking up what I'm trying to lay down today, but there's something about the name of Jesus. 75 times in the Gospels and Acts, we find phrases like the name of Jesus, the name of the Lord, his name, etc. See, Jesus' name is one of power, hope, healing, and help. But here's another takeaway I want you to take today from our passage. Number three, in the name of Jesus, we can have life. Life. Would you be honest with me? I've asked you a question. Would you raise your hand? Anybody exhausted right now? Exhausted. Come on, higher. Almost testify. You're exhausted. Whew. Somebody don't do a praise dance all the way around the room in a minute. Yes, I'm exhausted, Lord Jesus. I'm exhausted. You know why? Because we have bought, we have been spoon-fed this lie that we got to do better, try harder. We can't rest in Jesus because we haven't fully embraced the three words, the last three that he said, it is finished. Hey, do better, try harder. Exhausted. Hamster wheel. Merry-go-round, cobwebs, king's horses, king's men. You can have life. So not only can we find help and healing and hope in the name of Jesus, but we can also find real life in the name. Well, listen, we can only assume this helpless man's quality of life was not great prior to this miracle. It's only an assumption. Maybe in his view, because when you start to settle into something, you just kind of settle for something. But we can only assume that the man's quality of life probably wasn't great prior to the name of Jesus being spoken over and into him. His situation, his circumstance, his suffering, his need. Think about this, but listen to me. In the name of Jesus, we can find life, a quality of life that can only be described as miraculous, supernatural, extraordinary, abundant, and eternal. We can have a power-filled and purpose-filled life in the name of Jesus, which Perfectly sets up my next point. I want to take you back to the beginning in Acts 3 because there's a fourth thing I want you to recognize today about the name of Jesus is this. In the name of Jesus, we have authority. And this is a little secret. It's really not such a secret that we're not operating in very well. Look at 6. Peter says, I don't have silver and gold. See, most of the time, I've noticed even about myself is that I, 
and, and, and maybe it's just a, a hardwiring of being a man. I want to fix it. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? I want to fix it. I want to fix it. So I'm going to throw some silver at it. I'm going to throw some gold at it. I'm going to try to give you my encouraging words. I'm going to, I want to fix it. But listen, in the name of Jesus, you can have authority. Peter and John says, what you're looking for, we don't have. I don't have silver and gold. See, we got to stop living paralyzed by what we watch, by what we think we don't have, and start operating and giving from what we do have. Peter and John speaks from what they do have. In the name of Jesus, here's another thing. I don't know if I have in my notes. Maybe it's free. Maybe I wrote it and I'll get to it and I'll be really messed up. But check this out. We have authority in the name of Jesus, which means this. It doesn't depend on you. <laughs> you can be off the hook this morning. It doesn't depend on your ability. It doesn't depend on your, your wealth. It doesn't depend on your level of education. It doesn't depend on your ability to clearly articulate a point and speak fluently. It, doesn't, it does not depend on you. In the name of Jesus, walk, they say. I don't have silver and gold. But what I do have, I mean, how many times do we not act in faith because of what we are afraid we don't have? What we're afraid we can't do or what, we, or what we're afraid may not happen. As if Jesus needs our excuse. He has all authority. Listen, when it comes to matters where we're begging God for a miracle and we're not seeing the miracle happen, does that make God any less God? No. Does that make God wrong? No. No. This is why Jesus didn't... I don't think Jesus really wanted to do the cross thing. Look at Matthew 26, three times. Father, if there's any other way, I don't want to do this. But nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. How many times do we not act in faith because we're afraid of what we don't have? Or we're afraid that he may not do what we're asking him to do. We're afraid the outcome may not be what we're expecting or anticipating or hoping for. How many times do we not speak in the name of Jesus because of fear and insecurity and feelings of inadequacy and feelings of unworthiness, feelings of lack of preparedness, feelings of unbelief? See, they didn't have silver and gold to give, but what they did have, notice, they have nothing to give in and of themselves. Again, it doesn't depend on them. It doesn't depend on you. You're off the hook this morning. Everybody take a deep breath. It doesn't depend on us. But how many times do we try to operate in our own strength? When, when are we going to realize that we really don't have anything to offer? We don't have anything to give. But the power of God working in and through us, through the name of Jesus, as we declare his name in and over every situation that we encounter, that is where the power is going to be found. That is where transformation is going to happen. That is where we're going to begin to see the supernatural invade our natural. That's when we're going to be able to start talking about the extraordinary that's, that's breaking through the atmosphere of the ordinary. It's in the powerful name of Jesus. See, they didn't have silver and gold to give. But they also knew this. They weren't there to just put a Band-Aid on a bleeder. They weren't there to simply speak about a symptom. They're going to the source of all things, which is Jesus, to speak to the source of this man's situation. In the name of Jesus, walk. See, in the name of Jesus, get up. In the name of Jesus, step out of this situation. We, listen, can I tell you something, church? We actually have this same power. We have this same authority in Jesus' name. For those of us who have surrendered our lives to Jesus, we daily choose to say, I want to be crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that lives, but it's Jesus that lives in and through me. And now this life that I live in this flesh suit, I live by faith, forsaking all. I trust him and the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, Romans 8, 11. And now the very same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives within me. We have this same authority. 
We have this same identity. We have this same power flowing through our veins that we see in Peter and John. But do we choose to live this way? Do we choose to walk this way, to operate this way, to think this way? Do we choose to submit our lives to him in such a way that he is moving in and through our lives every day, day in and day out, as we pass by so many in need who sit and beg all around the beautiful gates of our city? Do we? See, in the name of Jesus, we also have authority and purpose. After all, let's not ignore or forget what the word of God says. Matthew 10, 1, it's echoed in Luke chapter 9, verse 1, says this. Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them what? Authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Mark chapter 16 verse 17 says this. And these signs will accompany those who have believed in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. Um, the book of Matthew chapter 10 verse 8 says this. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you have what? And freely do what? See, it's not just an idea. It's not just a, well, if you believe this way. Well, if it's convenient for the moment, if you don't feel insecure in the second. No, no, no. This is what we're told to do in the name of Jesus Christ. Heal the sick. Begin to pray and believe and declare the healing of Jesus that we see so beautifully illustrated in Isaiah 53, 5 through 10. It's by his stripes that we can even have this. He paid the price for healing. Pastor John, I prayed for my dad, and he, he didn't get up and walk. He passed away. Hey, get this, we're all going to pass away. It's, a, it's the perspective and the lens by which we're looking through. If this life is all you're living for, you're going to be really frustrated at God. If this life is it, I had a friend that used to say, if this is it, if this is the life you're living for, if you don't really know Jesus and the power of the name of Jesus, this life is the only heaven you'll ever know. But when you know Jesus, you begin to see this life is the only hell you'll ever know. So what's the perspective? This is what we're told to do. This is who we're told to be, how we're told to think, how we're told to function. By the way, this is the kingdom of God mindset. When the kingdom of God visits, when the kingdom of God comes upon you, this is what he's speaking about. The kingdom of heaven is forcefully advancing. It's always advancing, and forceful men take it by, by or men take it by force. This is what it's talking about in Matthew. This is, listen, I, I don't want to spend more time than I need to, but I, I need us to understand that if you were going to see systemic change, we're talking about trying to vote for change, legislate change, blah, 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 blah. It's not going to be found in that. It's going to be found when the people of God begin to function like people of God. It's going to be found when kingdom-minded people begin to do kingdom-living people and operating in the power and the authority of the name of Jesus. 1 John 2, 14, I've written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Listen, perspective. It's in the name of Jesus that we have this authority and we have this purpose. Bill Johnson says this. It is abnormal for a Christian not to have an appetite for the impossible. You see, it's so sad in our society, and I get it. You, you, you need to know who you're listening to and reading and all this stuff. There's a lot of people that think a lot of different things about Bill Johnson. But don't miss what he says here. Whatever it is you think about Bill Johnson, don't miss what it says. It is abnormal for a Christian not to have an appetite for the impossible. It has been written into our spiritual DNA to hunger for impossibilities around us to bow at the name of Jesus. That is a powerful word, and it's so true. See, I wonder, I wonder, do we have a hunger and a thirst that would bring us to a point where we begin to truly speak, live, but speak the name of Jesus in such deep faith over every situation that we're staring at. So how's your hunger? 
don't know, maybe it's uh, proportionate to the size of your need. You know, one of the issues we have is maybe we have too much silver and gold. I'm saying again. Does everybody understand what I'm saying about it? Maybe the issue is maybe we have too much silver and gold. We don't have a lot that we need to depend on. How's your hunger today? Here's what I do know. I know that we are not in deficit of need. There's a lot of need in the house. There's a lot of need in the city. There's a lot of need in the country. There's a lot of need in the world. We don't, we don't have a de deficit of need, but in the church, how's our hunger? How is our hunger? Listen, in the name of Jesus, we can have health and healing. We can have hope. We can have life. We can have authority and purpose. So as we began to discuss last week, when we asked the question, what's in a name? These things that we're speaking of, these are just some of the things that we find in the mighty, powerful name of Jesus. These are just some of the things that, that we are assured that we have access to in the name of Jesus. Listen, it may be time in faith to begin to speak the name of Jesus over your circumstance. It may very well be time to lift our eyes up to him with great boldness and belief, beginning to speak the name of Jesus over your situation, over your suffering, over your sickness, over your feelings of insecurity, inadequacy, anxiety, fear. It may be time to speak the name of Jesus over your worry or to keep declaring Jesus over and into it. Resist the devil and he will flee. Jesus, I resist worry. I rebuke it. Make it go. Fill me with peace. Fill me with assurance. Fill me with confidence. That's how to do that spiritual warfare. In fact, listen, somebody right now, deny your worry and just begin to worship. Right now. Right now. As you speak the name of Jesus. Speak the name of Jesus in faith. Speak the name of Jesus over your family. As we declared in that worship song just a little bit earlier in the service, with all that we have in the name of Jesus, let's shout Jesus from the mountains, right? Let's shout Jesus in the streets. Let's shout Jesus over the darkness. Every waged attack of the devil. Every just oppressive curse of the enemy. Start to speak the name of Jesus. Let's speak the holy, great, all-powerful name of Jesus with faith, the name that's above every name. Speak the name that the wind and the waves obey. Speak the name that calms the storms. Speak the name that causes mountains to literally bow low. Speak the name of Jesus. You better believe Jesus pays attention when his kids begin to cry out his name in faith. There's a song that says, um, all of heaven begins to rush down as we fill creation with the sound of the name of Jesus. Believe it. Listen, in the, in the name of Jesus, we can have help and healing. We can have hope. We can have life. We have authority. We have purpose. I want to leave you with this. John 14, 13 says this. Jesus himself actually said this. He says, whatever you ask in my name, in my name, that will I do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. There's your answer. But what if God doesn't answer the way I'm asking? Well, God is going to answer according to what glorifies Him the most in that moment. And we just got to be okay with that. We got to trust that He's working all things together somehow, even for our good. Listen, you may, you may be standing in the middle of hell right now with the war raging around you and you are doing your best moment by moment to declare and speak the name of Jesus over and over and over. Let me encourage you, do not stop. Keep declaring in faith, but let your heart say, God, whatever your will is, is what I want. But I'm not gonna stop declaring the name of my Jesus speak it. I'm going to shout it in the name of Jesus. Listen, in the name of Jesus, truly, when we speak the name of Jesus, here's the last thing, God is glorified. When we speak the name of Jesus, we glorify God. There's a story that's recorded of a famous theologian, Thomas Aquinas. He's visiting the Renaissance Pope, which is named Pope Innocent II. That's really his name. <laughs> 
The Pope shows Thomas the abundance of funds in the church treasury. Um, he shows him all these works of art. He shows him the extravagant decorations and ornaments in the chapel there at the Vatican. It's just showing him all around. And he says this. He says, you see, Thomas, the church can no longer say silver and gold have I none. Obviously referring to the words of Peter and John in Acts chapter 3, verse 6. And Thomas said this. He says, true. But I'm afraid neither can she now say in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. Because quite possibly we've grown far too accustomed and comfortable with relying on all the king's horses and all the king's men and all the silver and all the gold. Listen, where are the people of faith that are going to rise up and begin to declare and speak the name of Jesus? In the name of Jesus, we have help, healing, hope, life, authority, purpose. And in the name of Jesus, we can glorify God. Hey, would you close your eyes and stand with me as we close today? I don't know where you are and what's going on in your world. Maybe some of you I do. We're praying. There's a lot of you that I don't have the privilege to know everything that's going on. But I do know this. Whatever it is that you're facing, you not only have an ally, but listen to me, you have an advocate who is stronger than any force from hell that is throwing its darts at you. And that is Jesus. I'm going to encourage you. Speak the name of Jesus. Speak it loud. Speak it soft. It doesn't matter. We begin to speak and declare the name of Jesus. Father, we just pray today that you would let faith rise up. Let faith rise up. God, for every hurt and every place that we need healing, whatever that looks like. God, when we feel hopeless, when we feel unseen, unheard, unloved. God, when we feel like the world is against us and we're under attack, we just declare Jesus. We declare Jesus. God, in our, our deficiencies, in our inadequacies, in our insecurities, in our fear, in our anxiety, in our work, we declare Jesus. In our depression, we declare Jesus. For every need, we know that Jesus is the answer. It's not as simple as that, but it's as simple as that. So we simply in faith declare the name of Jesus. And if you're here this morning and your eyes are closed and you're walking through a moment where you know it's like you feel like the only the only means of survival is Jesus you're drowning you're at the point of near desperate or maybe you are desperate you need Jesus to step in would you simply slip a hand up so I know who I'm praying for right now All right, anybody else yeah yes Jesus, you see every hand, you know every heart, you know what we're dealing with. God, you know us. And I pray that you'd minister to everyone right now, right where they are, whether they're in this room with a hand raised or whether they're online, that you'd minister, that you'd begin to show them that not only are you manna for the moment, but you're a miracle in the making. You're a wonder working God. You are the way maker. You're working even when we don't know, even when we can't see. You're at work. And God, your power, you are more, in fact, all creation is subject under you. And so Lord, we ask that you would demand creation to be in alignment under your will, under your authority right now in whatever situation we're walking through. And show us, Father, reveal to us your love, reveal to us your heart, manifest your love in a way where we begin to see a miracle taking place and as we lay here at this beautiful gate today we don't wait for silver and gold we wait for what it is that you have for us Jesus we pray this in your name amen 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 can we just celebrate Jesus for a minute can you clap and shout and tell him that you love him today come on give him your best for just a minute give him your best